Before the main part of the podcast, I would like to give a little shout out to the University of Hertfordshire who are doing a doctoral study on something that is often overlooked in academia. They're conducting research into the experiences of parents or carers who help to look after a child or children where the family has a parent that has mental health difficulties. Now that is a bit of a mouthful. But what they're looking for are people that are supporting a family where the parent or a parent has a mental health condition and you're supporting their child within the family. And this study is aiming to learn more about the experiences of parents and carers who look after a child or children in the family where the parent has a mental health difficulty. So for example, this is if someone has a parent that has been living with bipolar or any other kind of mental health issue. So in this situation, what they're looking for are people such as the partner of the parent who is suffering from a mental health issue, the grandparents, older siblings, aunts and uncles. And so that's anyone that is really providing support to the child who is living with a parent that has a mental health issue. And these people will be often providing emotional support for the child. They may also help out with household chores and so forth. And these people are really important to the family and supporting the family generally. However, there's been a lack of research done on this area. So the guys at the University of Hertfordshire are looking for people who are looking after a child or children aged 4 to 17 with a parent that has a mental health difficulty. So this could be officially diagnosed or it could not be. So it doesn't really matter if it's diagnosed or not. Participants are expected or should be willing to take part in an interview with the researcher to talk about your experiences. And what will happen is that it will go into the larger study for the researchers to find out more about how your support is impacting the family and yourself. If you are willing to help out in this research, you will be asked to take part in an hour-long interview and this interview and its location is generally flexible depending on your individual needs. And if you are nowhere near Hertfordshire, they can do the interview via Skype with you. So if there's anyone out there that's listening to this podcast and you think that you fit this criteria and you would like to find out more about how you can get involved with this research, all you need to do is send an email to r.bishop at hearts.ac.uk or you can tweet at Becca JBG. I will put all of this in the show notes for you so that if you are interested and would like to participate, you can easily find the information. I think that this piece of research will be invaluable to those that are looking after or helping out a family who has mental health issues ongoing. And you telling them your own personal experiences can help with them supporting other people who find themselves in the situation as well as yourself. So that was just a little bit of a shout out to this research study being conducted at the University of Hertfordshire by Becca. So good luck, Becca, in your recruitment of participants. Hello and welcome to the Mental Health Book Club podcast with your hosts, Sydney Timmons and Becky Lawrence. We would like to take this opportunity to let you know that we will be covering a diverse range of mental health topics that may be distressing to some listeners. You can find a full list of the topics being covered in each episode in the show notes. Please check the show notes before listening to any of our episodes. Welcome to this week's episode of the Mental Health Book Club podcast with me, Sydney Timmins. And before we get started, I'd just like to say that this will be the last podcast of 2017 and we will be back on the 1st of January with Becky to discuss Am I Normal Yet? by Holly Bourne. If you would like to listen to our next episode now, you can become a Patreon supporter at patreon.com forward slash mhbc and supporting us with a donation of $2 per month, you could get our book episodes two weeks in advance. And in the new year, we plan to do some additional episodes that will be exclusively to patrons. And we really appreciate any support that you can offer. At this point, I would just like to remind listeners that I don't have any formal qualifications in psychology, so all of this information that I am telling you is from various sources on the internet, and I shall publish all of those into the blog post that will accompany this particular podcast. In this episode, I'm going to be doing a deep dive into acute stress disorder as a result of us reading Tiffany Golar's A Bitter Pill to Swallow. Whilst I was doing research for this particular podcast, I found out that 
The term ASD is also used for acute stress disorder as well as autism spectrum disorder. So I will try and use the full term rather than the acronym to try and avoid any confusion that you may have between the episodes that I've recorded. So I just thought I'd start off with some introduction about what acute stress disorder actually is. So it was originally added to the DSM-4 in the 1994 edition. And so prior to this, there was actually no diagnosis for the reaction related to trauma before 1994. So acute distress disorder or acute stress reaction is a mental health condition that is similar to post-traumatic stress disorder. And it's often diagnosed within a month of a traumatic experience, which we see with Devante. So what do they actually mean by trauma? So when they're talking about trauma in this case, this is a traumatic event that involves an actual threat to the individual's life. So that there is a risk of death, there is a risk of serious injury, there's some kind of physical violation such as rape, robbery or assault to an individual or others around that individual. In comparison to medical trauma, which is associated with medicine that is practiced within emergency rooms and represents a popular view of the term in comparison to that of the psychiatry term that I previously discussed. There are some issues within the literature on acute stress disorder because as a result of there not necessarily being a particular term that they had used before 1994, research and the tools that are used to research acute stress disorder are not comparable across studies because they're not using the same things. And so that makes research in this area particularly tricky. It also means that as a result of the differences in those research methods, the statistics associated with acute stress disorder vary widely between different studies. So for example, within one month of a trauma, survivors show rates of acute stress disorder that range from 6% to 33%, which is a marked difference between the two figures. Rates have also shown to differ between the different types of trauma a person may experience. So for example, survivors of accidents or disasters such as typhoons show lower rates of acute stress disorder, In comparison, survivors of violence such as robbery, assaults and mass shootings show rates that are much higher. And so I found some statistics specifically about the prevalence of acute stress disorder. And so it is thought for motor vehicle accidents that the prevalence of acute stress disorder is 13% to 21%. For mild traumatic brain injury, it's 14%. If the person has experienced an assault, it's 16% to 19%. If the person has experienced burns, it's 10%. If the person has experienced an industrial accident, it's 6% to 12%. If an individual has witnessed a mass shooting, it's 33%. And if that person has gone through a traumatic event such as rape, it's 94%. With acute stress disorder, it's often diagnosed after a traumatic event within a one-month period. If it is later than that, then it's often referred to as post-traumatic stress disorder. However, some people have dropped the disorder, but at the moment, if you are to Google post-traumatic stress, there is a lot of information that is still under the term post-traumatic stress disorder. So next, I'd like to go on to the DSM-5 diagnostic criteria for acute stress disorder. So for a diagnosis to be made, a person needs to meet the criteria that I'm about to explain to you. So part A, the person has an exposure to actual or threatened death, serious injury or sexual violation in one or more of the following ways. So these are the ways they've directly experienced the traumatic event. They've witnessed a person or the event as it occurred to others. They have learnt that a traumatic event has occurred to a close friend or family member. There is a note here that in cases of actual or threatened By death of a family member or friend, the event must have been violent or accidental. Experiencing repeated or extreme exposure to aversive details of the traumatic event. So that includes first responders collecting human remains, police officers repeatedly exposed to details of child abuse. And there's another note here. This does not apply to exposure through electronic media, television, movies or pictures unless this exposure is work related. Criteria B presence of nine or more of the following symptoms from any of the five categories of intrusion, negative mood, disassociation, avoidance and arousal, beginning or worsening after the traumatic event has occurred. 
So under intrusion symptoms, we have recurrent, involuntary and intrusive distressing memories of the traumatic event. So in children, repetitive play may occur in which themes or aspects of the traumatic event is exposed. Reoccurrent distressing dreams in which the content and or effect of the dream are related to the event. And again, note, in children older than six, there may be frightening dreams without recognisable content. Disassociative reactions, e.g. flashbacks, in which the individual feels or acts as if the traumatic event is reoccurring. Such reactions may occur on a continuum, with the most extreme expression being a complete loss of awareness of present surroundings. And another note, in children, trauma-specific reenactment may occur in play. And finally, in intrusion symptoms, is intense or prolonged psychological distress or marked physiological reactions in response to internal or external cues that symbolise or resemble an aspect of the traumatic event. In terms of negative mood, persistent inability to experience positive emotions, e.g. the inability to experience happiness, satisfaction or loving feelings. Under disassociative symptoms, we have an altered sense of the reality of one's surrounding or oneself. So that's seeing oneself from another perspective or being in a daze, the feeling that time is slowing down. Inability to remember an important aspect of the traumatic event, typically due to disassociative amnesia and not to other factors such as head injury, alcohol or drugs. Under avoidance symptoms, this includes efforts to avoid distressing memories, thoughts or feelings about or closely associated with the traumatic event. Efforts to avoid external reminders, so that's people, places, conversations, activities, objects, situations that arouse distressing memories, thoughts or feelings about or closely associated with traumatic events. Under arousal symptoms, we have sleep disturbances, e.g. difficulty falling or staying asleep or restless sleep. Irritable behaviour and angry outbursts with little or no provocation typically expressed as verbal or physical aggression towards people or objects, hypervigilance, problems with concentration, an exaggerated startle response. Criteria C, the duration of the disturbance symptoms in criteria B is three days to one month after trauma exposure. And another note here, symptoms typically begin immediately after trauma, but persistence for at least three days and up to a month is needed to meet criteria. Criteria D, the disturbance causes clinically significant distress or impairment in social, occupational or in other important areas of functioning. And criteria E, the disturbance is not attributable to the physiological effects of a substance, such as medication or alcohol or other medical conditions such as mild traumatic brain injuries and is not explained by brief psychotic disorder. So that's the criteria for acute stress disorder in the DSM-5. And we see most of this within Devante when we read A Bitter Pill to Swallow. So if we take each of those criteria in turn, we can see that he has been exposed to actual or threatened death. So there was gunshots, they were fired towards him. They may not have hit him, they hit Monica. However, he was at risk of death. In terms of criteria B, where he needs to have nine of the following symptoms from the five categories of intrusion, negative mood, disassociation, avoidance and arousal, we can see that he definitely does have the reoccurring, involuntary and intrusive distressing memories of the traumatic event. Within the book, there is a lot of description about what actually occurred at the time of the shooting. He has reoccurring, distressing dreams. We see that he definitely has sleep problems and that he also has flashbacks during the time that he is at not only his home, but when he moves into the Harrison School. And we also see that when he goes to school and he sees the pictures of Monica and the fact that the entire school is mourning for her, that he has deep psychological distress or marked physiological reactions as a response to seeing those external cues. In the book, in terms of negative mood, we also see that he is unable to feel happiness. I believe he describes that he feels like he's not going to feel happy again. I think at this point, in terms of disassociative symptoms, I'm not necessarily able to see those within the book at this point. However, that is not saying that they aren't there. 
In terms of avoidance symptoms with Devante, there is definitely efforts for him to avoid distressing memories. He also tries to avoid places, people, activities, objects, situations. So, for example, when he sees Janina's teddy bear, he has a flashback, so he tries to avoid that teddy bear. There's also the arousal symptoms such as the sleep disturbances. He's definitely hypervigilant. There is definitely issues with his concentration. He finds that he can't concentrate on anything around him. And that when there is loud noises, he does jump quite significantly. Or at least that is described within the book. The book also talks about the fact that he's been missing school for a few days before he is found out by his mother, which she then takes him to school and he then decides that he can't take it anymore and he tries to jump from the motorway bridge. And none of the above is as a result of him taking any alcohol or drugs or having any kind of brain injury that has resulted from the traumatic experience. In the last deep dive episode that I did, I talked about the ICD-10, which is the International Classification of Disorders Associated specifically in the US for health insurance purposes, but it's also used in the UK. And so I picked up the information from the ICD-10, and this is what it says. Acute stress reaction is a transient disorder that develops in an individual without any other apparent mental disorder in response to exceptional physical and mental stress, and that usually subsides within hours or days. Individual vulnerability and coping capacity play a role in the occurrence and severity of acute stress reactions. The symptoms show a typically mixed and changing picture and include an initial state of daze with some constriction of the field of consciousness and narrowing of attention, inability to comprehend stimuli and disorientation. This state may be followed either by further withdrawal from the surrounding situation to the extent of a disassociative stupor or by agitation and overactivity, so that's flight reaction. Autonomic signs of panic anxiety, such as tachycardia, sweating and flushing, are commonly present. The symptoms usually appear within minutes of the impact of the stressful stimulus or event and disappear within two to three days, often within hours. Partial or complete amnesia for the episode may be present. If the symptoms persist, a change in diagnosis should be considered. The ICD-11, which is in its beta draft and is due out in 2018, has also developed the acute stress reaction description further by saying that acute stress reaction refers to the development of transient emotional, somatic, cognitive or behavioural symptoms as a result of exposure to an event or situation, either short or long-lasting, of an extremely threatening or horrific nature, e.g. natural or human-made disasters, combat, serious accidents, sexual violence, assault. Symptoms may include autonomic signs of anxiety, such as tachycardia, sweating and flushing, being in a daze, confusion, sadness, anxiety, anger, despair, overreactivity, inactivity, social withdrawal or stupor. The response to the stressor is considered to be normal given the severity of the stressor and usually begins to subside within a few days after the event or following removal from the threatening situations. So this includes acute stress reaction, acute reaction to stress, and exclusions include post-traumatic stress disorder. If these kinds of symptoms persist for longer than the month period that we've discussed, then that is when a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress would be given to the individual suffering. So who is at risk of developing acute stress disorder and what impacts the risk of acute stress disorder? So there are several factors that can play a role. One of those is having gone through other traumatic events already, already having had acute stress disorder or post-traumatic stress disorder, having had prior mental health problems because that will impact the way that you deal with this particular trauma that you are experiencing, tending to have symptoms such as not knowing who you are or where you are when confronted with trauma, and a history of having disassociative symptoms during traumatic events prior to this incident as opposed to medical trauma, which is often associated with trauma medicine. As a general rule, it is thought that the person that is exposed to the trauma, the more direct they are involved in it, the more risk that they have of being mentally harmed. So for example, if the individual is caught in a school shooting, 
if they are the one that is shot, they will have more of a risk of developing acute stress disorder in comparison to the classmate that sees someone get shot. And that will also mean that that person is more at risk than a person who hears about the shooting from someone else or happens to be in the school at the time of the shooting but is away from the violence. Another example that I can provide is, say for example, you are in a car accident and you are the driver and you have been injured, you are more likely to suffer with acute stress disorder in comparison to someone who or someone who has witnessed the car accident and is a bystander to that particular traumatic event. So what are the treatments for acute stress disorder? As discussed on other podcasts associated with psychology, there is cognitive behaviour therapy and that has been shown to have a positive result on people suffering from acute stress disorder. Research shows that survivors who get CBT soon after going through a trauma are less likely to get post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms later on. A mental health care provider trained in treatment for trauma can judge whether CBT may be useful for that trauma survivor. So it's not necessarily useful for everyone who's gone through trauma. Another treatment for acute stress disorder is called psychological debriefing or PD. And this sometimes has been used in the wake of traumatic events. However, there is little research to back its use for effectively treating acute stress disorder or post-traumatic stress disorder. It should also be noted that there are more severe trauma or reactions such as post-traumatic stress disorder that debriefing is not recommended for. So this is only recommended under certain situations. Other treatment include medication. So that's the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, so SSRIs, or benzodiazepines. Finally, I'd like to just talk quickly about the risks of developing PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder as a result of suffering with acute stress disorder. So the diagnosis was established to identify those individuals who could eventually develop post-traumatic stress disorder. That was the whole point of them developing this particular term of acute stress disorder. Those that do not get acute stress disorder can develop post-traumatic stress disorder later on. And that is usually between 4 to 13% of people who have suffered a traumatic event. In comparison, 80% of people that are diagnosed with acute stress disorder go on to develop PTSD. And it's thought that if you try and treat the acute stress disorder, you can prevent the progression on to post-traumatic stress disorder. Therefore, getting in there early and trying to prevent the likelihood of developing post-traumatic stress disorder is extremely important. And early treatment that can be often within hours of the trauma can help to prevent the development of acute stress disorder and post-traumatic stress disorder. And people who are at high-risk jobs such as those in the army and that are in active combat, could benefit from preparation training and counselling to reduce the individual's risk. So this is just being able to prepare the person for the things that they may see. It may not be able to prevent the development completely, but it at least gives the individual a fighting chance. So I think I will do another episode specifically on post-traumatic stress disorder purely because I think it would make this particular podcast a bit too information heavy and we will probably have other books that we're going to read and discuss about post-traumatic stress. I will put the criteria for post-traumatic stress from the DSM into this particular blog post so that you'll be able to get all of the information if you do wish to understand more about that particular disorder. I am also in the process of compiling all of the information that I've gathered about all of the different mental health topics that we've covered and what I'm going to do is I'm going to release that as a book slash pdf to all of those that sign up to our mailing list. So you can sign up to our mailing list from our website by going to mentalhealthbookclub.com. After about 15 seconds, a pop-up will appear on the screen. And although it's not ready at the moment, as soon as it is ready, I will send that out to everyone on our mailing list. I will also then publish and send out regular updates to that particular document as we add more mental health topics. 
We hope that you are enjoying our podcasts and if there's anything that we can do differently or improve, feel free to let us know. You can either email us at hello at mentalhealthbookclub.com or you can tweet us using the Twitter handle mhbc underscore podcast or you can find us on Facebook or you can use the contact us form on our website. Both myself and Becky hope that you have a fantastic festive period. I know that for some people that this time of year can be particularly emotionally challenging. That is certainly the case for me. So just remember to take care of yourselves during this time. Don't beat yourselves up. Don't forget to do things that make you happy during this period. And remember, there is always help out there. Thanks for listening. Bye for now. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Mental Health Book Club podcast. If you feel that you need additional support with your mental health, please call the Samaritans on 116-123, which is a 24-hour helpline. And if you need additional information about mental health issues, please visit MIND at mind.org.uk. Our next book will be Am I Normal Yet? by Holly Bourne. You can find out more by visiting our website, which is mentalhealthbookclub.com. We would really love to hear what you think about this podcast. Please get in touch with us at our Facebook page, which is the Mental Health Book Club, or at our Twitter, which is at mhbc underscore podcast. And if you like the podcast, please share it with your family and friends and leave us a five star rating on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. You can further show your support by contributing to the Mental Health Book Club podcast at Patreon by visiting patreon.com forward slash mhbc.